The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 8, Side 1. In the spring of 480, the great host reached the Hellespont, where Egyptian and Phoenician engineers had built a bridge that was among the most admired mechanical achievements of antiquity. If again we may follow Herodotus, 674 ships of trireme or pentaconter size were distributed in two rows athwart the strait, each vessel facing the current, and moored with the heavy anchor. Then the builders stretched cables of flax or papyrus over each row of ships from bank to bank, bound the cables to every ship, and made them taut with capstans on the shore. Trees were cut and sawn into planks, and these, laid across the cables, were fastened to them and to one another. The planks were covered with brushwood and this with earth, and the whole was trodden down to resemble a road. A bulwark was erected on each side of the causeway, high enough to keep animals from taking fright at sight of the sea. Nevertheless, many of the beasts and some of the soldiers had to be driven by the lash to trust themselves to the bridge. It stood the burden well, and in seven days and nights the entire host had passed over it successfully. A native of the region, seeing the spectacle, concluded that Xerxes was Zeus, and asked why the master of gods and men had taken so much trouble to conquer little Greece, when he might have destroyed the presumptuous nation with one thunderbolt. The army marched overland through Thrace and down into Macedonia and Thessaly, while the Persian fleet, hugging the coasts, avoided the storms of the Aegean by passing southward through a canal dug by forced labor across the Isthmus at Mount Athos to the length of a mile and a quarter. Wherever the army ate two meals, we are told, the city that fed it was utterly ruined. Phasos spent four hundred silver talents, approximately a million dollars, in playing host to Xerxes for a day. The northern Greeks, even to the Attic frontiers, surrendered to fear or bribery, and allowed their troops to be added to Xerxes's millions. Only Plataea and Thespii, in the north, prepared to fight. 4. Salamis How can we imagine today the terror and desperation of the southern Greeks at the approach of this polyglot avalanche? Resistance seemed insane. The loyal states could not muster one-tenth of Xerxes's force. For once Athens and Sparta worked together with single mind and heart. Delegates were sped to every city in the Peloponnesus to beg for troops or supplies. Most of the states cooperated. Argos refused and never lived down her disgrace. Athens fitted out a fleet that sailed north to meet the Persian armada, and Sparta dispatched a small force under King Leonidas to halt Xerxes for a while at Thermopylae. The two navies met at Artemisium, off the northern coast of Euboea. When the Greek admirals saw the overwhelming number of the enemy's vessels, they were of a mind to withdraw. The Eubeans, fearing a descent of the Persians upon their shores, sent to Themistocles, commander of the Athenian contingent, a bribe of thirty talents, $180,000, on condition that he persuade the Greek leaders to fight. He succeeded by sharing the bribe. With characteristic subtlety, Themistocles had sailors inscribe upon the rocks messages to the Greeks and the Persian fleet begging them to desert, or in any case not to fight against their motherland. He hoped that if the Ionians saw these words they would be moved by them, and that if Xerxes saw and understood them the king would not dare to use Hellenes in the battle. All day the rival fleets fought until night put an end to the engagement before either side could win. The Greeks then retired to Artemisium, the Persians to Alphiti. Considering the inequality of numbers, the Greeks justifiably looked upon the battle as a victory. When news came of the disaster at Thermopylae, the surviving Greek fleet sailed south to Salamis to provide a refuge for Athens. Meanwhile, Leonidas, despite the most heroic resistance in history, had been overwhelmed at the hot gates, not so much by the bravery of the Persians as by the treachery of Hellenes. Certain Greeks from Trachis not only betrayed to Xerxes the secret of the indirect route over the mountains, but led the Persian force by that approach to attack the Spartans in the rear. Leonidas and his three hundred elders, for he had chosen only fathers of sons to go with him, lest any Spartan family should be extinguished, died almost to the last man. Of the two Spartan survivors, one fell at Plataea, the other hanged himself for shame. The Greek historians assure us that the Persians lost twenty thousand, the Greeks three hundred. Over the tomb of the latter heroes was placed the most famous of Greek epitaphs. Go, stranger, and tell the Lacedaemonians that we lie here in obedience to their laws. When the Athenians learned that no barrier now remained between Athens and the Persians, proclamation was made that every Athenian should save his family as best he could. Some fled to Aegina, some to Salamis, some to Treason. 
Some of the men were enlisted to fill up the crews of the fleet that was returning from Artemisium. Plutarch paints a touching picture of how the tame animals of the city followed their masters to the shore and howled when the overladen vessels drew off without them. One dog, belonging to Pericles' father, Xanthippus, leaped into the sea and swam alongside his ship to Salamis, where it died of exhaustion. We may judge of the excitement and passion of those days when we learn that an Athenian who, in the assembly, advised surrender, was killed there and then, and that a crowd of women went to his house and stoned his wife and children to death. When Xerxes arrived, he found the city almost deserted and gave it over to pillage and fire. Soon afterward, the Persian fleet, twelve hundred strong, entered the Bay of Salamis. Against it were ranged three hundred Greek triremes, still under divided command. The majority of the admirals were opposed to risking an engagement. Resolved to force action upon the Greeks, Themistocles resorted to a stratagem that would have cost him his life had the Persians won. He sent a trusted slave to Xerxes to tell him that the Greeks were intending to sail away during the night and that the Persians could prevent this only by surrounding the Greek fleet. Xerxes accepted the advice, and on the next morning, with every escape blocked, the Greeks were compelled to give fight. Xerxes, seated in state at the foot Mount Egalius, on the Attic shore across from Salamis, watched the action, and noted the names of those of his men who fought with especial bravery. The superior tactics and seamanship of the Hellenes, and the confusion of tongues, mines, and superfluous ships among the Orientals, finally decided the issue in favor of Greece. According to Diodorus, the invaders lost two hundred vessels, the defenders forty. But we do not have the Persian side of the story. Few of the Greeks, even from the lost ships, died, for being all excellent swimmers, they swam to land when their boats foundered. The remnant of the Persian fleet fled to the Hellespont, and the subtle Themistocles sent his slave again to Xerxes to say that he had dissuaded the Greeks from pursuit. Xerxes left three hundred thousand men under command of Mardonius, and with the rest of his troops marched back in humiliation to Sardis, a large part of his force dying of pestilence and dysentery on the way. In the same year as Salamis, possibly as the Greeks would have it on the same day, September 23rd, 480 B.C., the Greeks of Sicily fought the Carthaginians at Himera. We do not know that the Phoenicians of Africa were acting in concert with those who supported Xerxes, and so largely manned his fleet. Perhaps it was only a coincidence that Greece found itself assaulted in east and west at once. In the traditional account, Hamilcar, the Carthaginian admiral, arrived at Panormus with three thousand ships and three hundred thousand troops. He proceeded thence to lay siege to Himera, where he was met by Gilon of Syracuse with fifty-five thousand men. After the fashion of Punic generals, Hamilcar stood aside from the battle and burned sacrificial victims to his gods as the contest raged. When his defeat became evident, he threw himself into the fire. A tomb was erected to him on the site, and there his grandson Himilcon, seventy years afterwards, slaughtered three thousand Greek captives in revenge. A year later, August 479, the liberation of Greece was completed by almost simultaneous engagements on land and sea. Mardonius's army, living leisurely on the country, had pitched its camp near Plataea on the Boeotian plain. There, after two weeks of waiting for propitious omens, a Greek force of one hundred ten thousand men, led by the Spartan king Pausanias, joined issue with them in the greatest land battle of the war. The non-Persians in the invading force had no heart for the conflict, and took to flight as soon as the Persian contingent, which bore the point of the attack, began to waver. The Greeks won so overwhelming a victory that, according to their historians, they lost but 159 men, while of the Persian force 260,000 were slain. These figures from Herodotus are presumably an outburst of patriotic imagination. Plutarch, trying to be impartial, raises the Greek loss to 1360, and Diodorus Siculus, though always generous with numbers, lowers the Persian loss to 100,000. But even Plutarch and Diodorus were Greeks. On the same day, the Greeks of Ur, a Greek squadron met a Persian flotilla off the coast of Mycale, the central meeting place of all Ionia. The Persian fleet was destroyed, the Ionian cities were freed from Persian rule, and control of the Hellespont and the Bosporus was won by the Greeks as they had won it from Troy seven hundred years before. The Greco-Persian War was the most momentous conflict in European history, for it made Europe possible. It won for Western civilization the opportunity to develop its own economic life, unburdened with alien tribute or taxation, and its own political institutions, free from the dictation of Oriental kings. It won for Greece a clear road for the first great experiment in liberty. It preserved the Greek mind for three centuries from the enervating mysticism of the East 
and secured for Greek enterprise full freedom of the sea. The Athenian fleet that remained after Salamis now opened every port in the Mediterranean to Greek trade, and the commercial expansion that ensued provided the wealth that financed the leisure and culture of Periclean Athens. The victory of Little Hellas against such odds stimulated the pride and lifted up the spirit of its people. Out of very gratitude they felt called upon to do unprecedented things. After centuries of preparation and sacrifice, Greece entered upon its golden age. Book 3. The Golden Age, 480-399 to B.C. Chapter 11. Pericles and the Democratic Experiment 1. The Rise of Athens The period which intervened between the birth of Pericles and the death of Aristotle, wrote Shelley, is undoubtedly, whether considered in itself or with reference to the effect which it has produced upon the subsequent destinies of civilized man, the most memorable in the history of the world. Athens dominated this period because she had won the allegiance and contributions of most Aegean cities by her leadership in saving Greece, and because, when the war was over, Ionia was impoverished and Sparta was disordered by demobilization, earthquake, and insurrection, while the fleet that Themistocles had created now rivaled with the conquests of commerce its victories at Artemisium and Salamis. Not that the war was quite over. Intermittently, the struggle between Greece and Persia continued from the conquest of Ionia by Cyrus to the overthrow of Darius III by Alexander. The Persians were expelled from Ionia in 479, from the Black Sea in 478, from Thrace in 475, and in 468 a Greek fleet under Simon of Athens decisively defeated the Persians on land and sea at the mouth of the Eurymedon. The Greek cities of Asia and the Aegean for their protection against Persia, now, in 477, organized under Athenian leadership the Delian Confederacy and contributed to a common fund in the Temple of Apollo on Delos. Since Athens donated ships instead of money, it soon exercised, through its sea power, an effective control over its allies, and rapidly the Confederacy of Equals was transformed into an Athenian empire. In this policy of imperial aggrandizement, all the major statesmen of Athens, even the virtuous Aristides and later the impeccable Pericles, joined with the unscrupulous Themistocles. No other man had deserved so well of Athens as Themistocles, and no one was more resolved than he to be repaid for it. When the Greek leaders met to give first and second awards to those men who had most ably defended Greece in the war, each of them voted for himself first, and for Themistocles second. It was he who set the course of Greek history by persuading Athens that the road to supremacy lay not on land but on the sea, and not by war so much as by trade. He negotiated with Persia and sought to end the strife between the old and the young empire in order that unimpeded commerce with Asia might bring prosperity to Athens. Under his prodding, the men, even the women and children of Athens, raised a wall around the city and another around the ports at the Piraeus and Munichia. Under his lead, carried forward by Pericles, great quays, warehouses, and exchanges were erected at the Piraeus, providing every convenience for maritime trade. He knew that these policies would arouse the jealousy of Sparta and might lead to war between the rival states. But he was stirred on by his vision of Athens's development and his confidence in the Athenian fleet. His aims were as magnificent as his means were venal. He used the navy to force tribute from the Cyclades, on the ground that they had yielded too quickly to the Persians and had lent Xerxes their troops, and he appears to have accepted bribes to let some cities off. For like considerations he arranged the recall of exiles, sometimes keeping the money, says Timocreon, though he failed to obtain the recall. When Aristides was placed in charge of the public revenue, he found that his predecessors had embezzled public funds, and not the least lavishly, Themistocles. Toward 471 the Athenians, fearing his unmoral intellect, passed a vote of ostracism upon him, and he sought a new home in Argos. Shortly thereafter, the Spartans found documents apparently implicating Themistocles in the secret correspondence of their regent Pausanias, whom they had starved to death for entering into traitorous negotiations with Persia. Happy to destroy her ablest enemy, Sparta revealed these papers to Athens, which at once sent out an order for Themistocles' arrest. He fled to Corsaira, was denied refuge there, found brief asylum in Epirus, and thence sailed secretly to Asia, where he claimed from Xerxes's successor some reward for restraining the Greek pursuit of the Persian fleet after Salamis. Lured by Themistocles's promise to help him subjugate Greece, Artaxerxes I received him into his counsels, 
and assigned the revenues of several cities for his maintenance. Before Themistocles could carry out the schemes that never let him rest, he died at Magnesia in 449 B.C. at the age of 65, admired and disliked by all the Mediterranean world. After the passing of Themistocles and Aristides, the leadership of the democratic faction at Athens descended to Ephialtes, and that of the oligarchic or conservative faction to Simon, son of Miltiades. Simon had most of the virtues that Themistocles lacked, but none of the subtlety that ability must depend upon for political success. Unhappy amid the intrigues of the city, he secured command of the fleet and consolidated the liberties of Greece by his victory at the Eurymedon. Returning to Athens in glory, he at once lost his popularity by advising a reconciliation with Sparta. He won the assembly's reluctant consent to lead an Athenian force to the aid of the Spartans against their revolted helots at Ithome. But the Spartans suspected the Athenians even when bringing gifts, and so clearly distrusted Simon's soldiers that these returned to Athens in anger, and Simon was disgraced. In 461 he was ostracized at the instigation of Pericles, and the oligarchic party was so demoralized by his fall that for two generations the government remained in the hands of the Democrats. Four years later Pericles, repentant, or rumor said enamored of Simon's sister Elpinice, secured his recall, and Simon died with honors in a naval campaign in Cyprus. The leader of the Democratic Party at this time was a man of whom we know strangely little, and yet his activity was a turning point in the history of Athens. Ephialtes was poor but incorruptible, and did not long survive the animosities of Athenian politics. The popular faction had been strengthened by the war, for in that crisis all class divisions among freemen had for a moment been forgotten, and the saving victory at Salamis had been won not by the army, which was dominated by the aristocrats, but by the navy, which was manned by the poorer citizens and controlled by the mercantile middle class. The oligarchic party sought to maintain its privileges by making the conservative Areopagus the supreme authority in the state. Ephialtes replied by a bitter attack upon this ancient senate. He impeached several of its members for malfeasance, had some of them put to death, and persuaded the assembly to vote the almost complete abolition of the powers that the Areopagus still retained. The conservative Aristotle later approved this radical policy on the ground that the transfer to the commons of the judicial functions that had belonged to the Senate appears to have been an advantage, for corruption finds an easier material in a small number than in a large one. But the conservatives of the time did not see the issue so calmly. Ephialtes, having been found unpurchasable, was assassinated in 461 by an agent of the oligarchy, and the perilous task of leading the Democratic Party passed down to the aristocratic Pericles. 2. Pericles The man who acted as commander-in-chief of all the physical and spiritual forces of Athens during her greatest age was born some three years before Marathon. His father, Xanthippus, had fought at Salamis, had led the Athenian fleet in the Battle of Mycale, and had recaptured the Hellespont for Greece. Pericles's mother, Agoristi, was a granddaughter of the reformer Cleisthenes. On her side, therefore, he belonged to the ancient family of the Alcmeonids. His mother, being near her time, says Plutarch, fancied in a dream that she was brought to bed of a lion, and a few days after was delivered of Pericles. In other respects perfectly formed, only his head was somewhat longish and out of proportion. His critics were to have much fun with this very dolicocephalic head. The most famous music teacher of his time, Damon, gave him instruction in music, and Pythoclides in music and literature. He heard the lectures of Zeno the Eleatic at Athens, and became the friend and pupil of the philosopher Anaxagoras. In his development he absorbed the rapidly growing culture of his epoch, and united in his mind and policy all the threads of Athenian civilization, economic, military, literary, artistic, and philosophical. He was, so far as we know, the most complete man that Greece produced. Seeing that the oligarchic party was out of step with the time, he attached himself early in life to the party of the Demos, that is, the free population of Athens. Then, as even in Jefferson's day in America, the word people carried certain proprietary reservations. He approached politics in general and each situation in it with careful preparation, neglecting no aspect of education, speaking seldom and briefly, and praying to the gods that he might never utter a word that was not to the point. Even the comic poets who disliked him spoke of him as the Olympian, who wielded the thunder and lightning of such eloquence as Athens had never heard before. And yet by all accounts his speech was unimpassioned and appealed to enlightened minds. His influence was due not only to his intelligence but to his probity. He was capable of using bribery to secure state ends, but was himself 
manifestly free from every kind of corruption and superior to all considerations of money. And whereas Themistocles had entered public office poor and left it rich, Pericles, we are told, added nothing to his patrimony by his political career. It showed the good sense of the Athenians in this generation that for almost thirty years, between 467 and 428, they elected and re-elected him, with brief intermissions, as one of their ten strategoi or commanders. And this relative permanence of office not only gave him supremacy on the military board, but enabled him to raise the position of strategos autocrator to the place of highest influence in the government. Under him, Athens, while enjoying all the privileges of democracy, acquired also the advantages of aristocracy and dictatorship. The good government and cultural patronage that had adorned Athens in the age of Pisistratus were continued now with equal unity and decisiveness of direction and intelligence, but also with the full and annually renewed consent of a free citizenship. History through him illustrated again the principle that liberal reforms are most ably executed and most permanently secured by the cautious and moderate leadership of an aristocrat enjoying popular support. Greek civilization was at its best when democracy had grown sufficiently to give it variety and vigor, and aristocracy survived sufficiently to give it order and taste. The reforms of Pericles substantially extended the authority of the people. Though the power of the Heliaea had grown under Solon, Cleisthenes, and Epialtes, the lack of payment for jury service had given the well-to-do a predominating influence in these courts. Pericles introduced in 451 a fee of two obols, or thirty-four cents, later raised to three, for a day's duty as juror, an amount equivalent in each case to half a day's earnings of an average Athenian of the time. The notion that these modest sums weakened the fiber and corrupted the morale of Athens is hardly to be taken seriously, for by the same token every state that pays its judges or its jurymen would long since have been destroyed. Pericles seems also to have established a small remuneration for military service. He crowned this scandalous generosity by persuading the state to pay every citizen two obols annually as the price of admission to the plays and games of the official festivals. He excused himself on the ground that these performances should not be a luxury of the upper and middle classes, but should contribute to elevate the mind of the whole electorate. It must be confessed, however, that Plato, Aristotle, and Plutarch, conservatives all, were agreed that these pittances injured the Athenian character. Continuing the work of Ephialtes, Pericles transferred to the popular courts the various judicial powers that had been possessed by the archons and magistrates, so that from this time the archonship was more of a bureaucratic or administrative office than one that carried the power of forming policies, deciding cases, or issuing commands. In 457, eligibility to the archonship, which had been confined to the wealthier classes, was extended to the third class, or zugatai. Soon thereafter, without any legal form, the lowest citizen class, the Thetes, made themselves eligible to the office by romancing about their income. And the importance of the Thetes in the defense of Athens persuaded the other classes to wink at the fraud. Moving for a moment in the opposite direction, Pericles in 451 carried through the assembly a restriction of the franchise to the legitimate offspring of an Athenian father and an Athenian mother. No legal marriage was to be permitted between a citizen and a non-citizen. It was a measure aimed to discourage intermarriage with foreigners, to reduce illegitimate births, and perhaps to reserve to the jealous burghers of Athens the material rewards of citizenship and empire. Pericles himself would soon have reason to regret this exclusive legislation. Since any form of government seems good that brings prosperity, and even the best seems bad that hinders it, Pericles, having consolidated his political position, turned to economic statesmanship. He sought to reduce the pressure of population upon the narrow resources of Attica by establishing colonies of poor Athenian citizens upon foreign soil. To give work to the idle, he made the state an employer on a scale unprecedented in Greece. Ships were added to the fleet, arsenals were built, and a great corn exchange was erected at the Piraeus. To protect Athens effectively from siege by land, and at the same time to provide further work for the unemployed, Pericles persuaded the assembly to supply funds for constructing eight miles of long walls, as they were to be called, connecting Athens with the Piraeus and Phalerum. The effect was to make the city and its ports one fortified enclosure, open in wartime only to the sea, on which the Athenian fleet was supreme. In the hostility with which unwalled Sparta looked upon this program of fortification, the oligarchic party saw a chance to recapture political power. Its secret agents invited the Spartans to invade Attica and, with the aid of an oligarchic insurrection, to put down the democracy. 
In this event, the oligarchs pledged themselves to level the long walls. The Spartans agreed and dispatched an army which defeated the Athenians at Tanagra in 457. But the oligarchs failed to make their revolution. The Spartans returned to the Peloponnesus empty-handed, duerly awaiting a better opportunity to overcome the flourishing rival that was taking from them their traditional leadership of Greece. Pericles rejected the temptation to retaliate upon Sparta, and instead devoted his energies now to the beautification of Athens. Hoping to make his city the cultural center of Hellas, and to rebuild the ancient shrines which the Persians had destroyed, on a scale and with a splendor that would lift up the soul of every citizen, he devised a plan for using all the genius of Athens's artists and the labor of her remaining unemployed in a bold program for the architectural adornment of the Acropolis. It was his desire and design, says Plutarch, that the undisciplined mechanic multitude should not go without their share of public funds, and yet should not have these given them for sitting still and doing nothing, and to this end he brought in these vast projects of construction. To finance the undertaking, he proposed that the treasury accumulated by the Delian Confederacy should be removed from Delos, where it lay idle and insecure, and that such part of it as was not needed for common defense should be used to beautify what seemed to Pericles the legitimate capital of a beneficent empire. The transference of the Delian treasury to Athens was quite acceptable to the Athenians, even to the oligarchs. But the voters were loath to spend any substantial part of the fund in adorning their city whether through some qualm of conscience or through a secret hope that the money might be appropriated more directly to their needs and enjoyment. The oligarchic leaders played upon this feeling so cleverly that when the matter neared a vote in the assembly, the defeat of Pericles' plan seemed certain. Plutarch tells a delightful story of how the subtle leader turned the tide. Very well, said Pericles, let the cost of these buildings go not to your account but to mine, and let the inscription upon them stand in my name. When they heard him say this, whether it were out of a surprise to see the greatness of his spirit, or out of emulation of the glory of the works, they cried aloud, bidding him spend on, and spare no cost, till all were finished. While the work proceeded, and Pericles' especial protection and support were given to Phidias, Ictinus, Nesicles, and the other artists who labored to realize his dreams, he lent his patronage also to literature and philosophy. And whereas in the other Greek cities of this period the strife of parties consumed much of the energy of the citizens, and literature languished, in Athens the stimulus of growing wealth and democratic freedom was combined with wise and cultured leadership to produce the Golden Age. When Pericles, Aspasia, Phidias, Anaxagoras, and Socrates attended a play by Euripides in the theater of Dionysus, Athens could see visibly the zenith and unity of the life of Greece. Statesmanship, art, science, philosophy, literature, religion, and morals, living no separate career as in the pages of chroniclers, but woven into one many-colored fabric of a nation's history. The affections of Pericles wavered between art and philosophy, and he might have found it hard to say whether he loved Phidias or Anaxagoras the more. Perhaps he turned to Aspasia as a compromise between beauty and wisdom. For Anaxagoras he entertained, we are told, an extraordinary esteem and admiration. It was the philosopher, says Plato, who deepened Pericles into statesmanship. From long intercourse with Anaxagoras, Plutarch believes, Pericles derived not merely elevation of purpose and dignity of language, raised far above the base and dishonest buffooneries of mob eloquence, but besides this, a composure of countenance and a serenity and calmness in all his movements which no occurrence whilst he was speaking could disturb. When Anaxagoras was old and Pericles was absorbed in public affairs, the statesman for a time let the philosopher drop out of his life. But later, hearing that Anaxagoras was starving, Pericles hastened to his relief and accepted humbly his rebuke that those who have occasion for a lamp supply it with oil. It seems hardly credible, and yet on second thought most natural, that the stern Olympian should have been keenly susceptible to the charms of woman. His self-control fought against a delicate sensibility, and the toils of office must have heightened in him the normal male longing for feminine tenderness. He had been many years married when he met Aspasia. She belonged to, she was helping to create, the type of hetaira that was about to play so active a part in Athenian life, a woman rejecting the seclusion that marriage brought to the ladies of Athens, and preferring to live in unlicensed unions, even in relative promiscuity, if thereby she might enjoy the same freedom of movement and conduct as men and participate with them in their cultural interests. We have no testimony to Aspasia's beauty, though ancient writers speak of her small, high-arched foot, 
her silvery voice and her golden hair. Aristophanes, an unscrupulous political enemy of Pericles, describes her as a Milesian courtesan who had established a luxurious brothel at Megara and had now imported some of her girls into Athens, and the great comedian delicately suggests that the quarrel of Athens with Megara, which precipitated the Peloponnesian War, was brought about because Aspasia persuaded Pericles to revenge her upon Megarians who had kidnapped some of her personnel. But Aristophanes was not an historian, and may be trusted only where he himself is not concerned. Arriving in Athens about 450, Aspasia opened a school of rhetoric and philosophy, and boldly encouraged the public emergence and higher education of women. Many girls of good family came to her classes, and some husbands brought their wives to study with her. Men also attended her lectures, among them Pericles and Socrates, and probably Anaxagoras, Euripides, Alcibiades, and Phidias. Socrates said that he had learned from her the art of eloquence, and some ancient gossips would have it that the statesman inherited her from the philosopher. Pericles now found it admirable that his wife had formed an affection for another man. He offered her her freedom in return for his own, and she agreed. She took a third husband, while Pericles brought Aspasia home. By his own law of 451 he could not make her his wife, since she was of Milesian birth. Any child he might have by her would be illegitimate and ineligible to Athenian citizenship. He seems to have loved her sincerely, even uxoriously, never leaving his home or returning to it without kissing her, and finally willing his fortune to the son that she bore him. From that time onward he forewent all social life outside his home, seldom going anywhere except to the Agora or the council hall the people of Athens began to complain of his aloofness. For her part, Aspasia made his home a French Enlightenment salon, where the art and science, the literature, philosophy, and statesmanship of Athens were brought together in mutual stimulation. Socrates marveled at her eloquence and credited her with composing the funeral oration that Pericles delivered after the first casualties of the Peloponnesian War. Aspasia became the uncrowned queen of Athens, setting fashion's tone and giving to the women of the city an exciting example of mental and moral freedom. The conservatives were shocked at all this and turned it to their purposes. They denounced Pericles for leading Greeks out to war against Greeks, as in Aegina and Samos. They accused him of squandering public funds. Finally, through the mouths of irresponsible comic dramatists abusing the free speech that prevailed under his rule, they charged him with turning his home into a house of ill fame, and having relations with the wife of his son. Not daring to bring any of these matters to open trial, they attacked him through his friends. They indicted Phidias for embezzling, as they alleged, some of the gold assigned to him for his Chryselephantine Athena, and apparently succeeded in convicting him. They indicted Anaxagoras on the ground of irreligion, and the philosopher, on Pericles' advice, fled into exile. They brought against Aspasia a like writ of impiety, complaining that she had shown disrespect for the gods of Greece. The comic poets satirized her mercilessly as a Dionyra who had ruined Pericles, and called her in plain Greek a concubine. One of them, Hermippus, doubtless in turn a dishonest penny, accused her of serving as Pericles's procurus, and of bringing free-born women to him for his pleasure. At her trial, which took place before a court of fifteen hundred jurors, Pericles spoke in her defense, using all his eloquence even to tears and the case was dismissed. From that moment, 432, Pericles began to lose his hold upon the Athenian people, and when three years later death came to him, he was already a broken man. 3. Athenian Democracy 1. Deliberation These strange indictments suffice to show how real was the limited democracy that functioned under the supposed dictatorship of Pericles. We must study this democracy carefully, for it is one of the outstanding experiments in the history of government. It is limited first by the fact that only a small minority of the people can read. It is limited physically by the difficulty of reaching Athens from the remoter towns of Attica. The franchise is restricted to those sons of two free Athenian parents who have reached the age of twenty-one, and only they and their families enjoy civil rights or directly bear the military and fiscal burdens of the state. Within this jealously circumscribed circle of 43,000 citizens out of an Attic population of 315,000, political power in the days of Pericles is formally equal. Each citizen enjoys and insists upon isonomia and isagoria, equal rights at law and in the assembly. To the Athenian, a citizen is a man who not only votes, but takes his turn by lot and rote as magistrate or judge. 
He must be free, ready, and able to serve the state at any time. No one who is subject to another, or who has to labor in order to live, can have the time or the capacity for these services, and therefore the manual worker seems to most Athenians unfit for citizenship, though with human inconsistency they admit the peasant proprietor. All of the 115,000 slaves of Attica, all women, nearly all working men, all of the 28,500 metics or resident aliens, and consequently a great part of the trading class, are excluded from the franchise. The voters are not gathered into parties, but are loosely divided into followers of the oligarchic or the democratic factions, according as they oppose or favor the extension of the franchise, the dominance of the assembly, and the governmental succor of the poor at the expense of the rich. The active members of each faction are organized into clubs called hetairii, companionships. There are clubs of all kinds in Periclean Athens, religious clubs, kinship clubs, military clubs, workers' clubs, actors' clubs, political clubs, and clubs honestly devoted to eating and drinking. The strongest of all are the oligarchic clubs, whose members are sworn to mutual aid in politics and law, and are bound by a common passionate hostility to those lower enfranchised ranks that press upon the toes of the landed aristocracy and the moneyed merchant class. Against them stand the relatively democratic party, of small businessmen, of citizens who have become wage workers, and of those who man the merchant ships and the Athenian fleet. These groups resent the luxuries and privileges of the rich and raise up to leadership in Athens such men as Cleon the Tanner, Lysicles the sheep dealer, Eucrates the toe seller, Cleophon the harp manufacturer, and Hyperbolus the lamp maker. Pericles holds them off for a generation by a subtle mixture of democracy and aristocracy, but when he dies they inherit the government and thoroughly enjoy its perquisites. From Solon to the Roman conquest, this bitter conflict of oligarchs and democrats is waged with oratory, votes, ostracism, assassination, and civil war. Every voter is of right a member of the basic governing body, the ecclesia, or assembly. There is at this level no representative government. Since transportation is difficult over the hills of Attica, only a fraction of the eligible members ever attend any one meeting. There are rarely more than two or three thousand. Those citizens who live in Athens or at the Piraeus come by a kind of geographical determinism to dominate the assembly. In this way, the Democrats gain ascendancy over the conservatives, who are for the most part scattered among the farms and estates of Attica. The assembly meets four times a month, on important occasions in the Agora, in the theater of Dionysus, or at the Piraeus, ordinarily in a semicircular place called the Penix, on the slope of a hill west of the Areopagus. In all these cases, the members sit on benches under the open sky, and the sitting begins at dawn. Each session opens with the sacrifice of a pig to Zeus. It is usual to adjourn at once in case of a storm, earthquake, or eclipse, for these are accounted signs of divine disapproval. New legislation may be proposed only at the first session of each month, and the member who offers it is held responsible for the result of its adoption. If these are seriously evil, another member may within a year of the vote invoke upon him the graphe paranamon, or writ of illegality, and have him fined, disenfranchised, or put to death. This is Athens's way of discouraging hasty legislation. By another form of the same writ, a new proposal may be checked by a demand that before its enactment, one of the courts shall pass upon its constitutionality, that is, its agreement with existing law. Again, before considering a bill, the assembly is required to submit it to the Council of Five Hundred for preliminary examination, very much as a bill in the American Congress, before discussion of it on the floor, is referred to a committee presumed to have a special knowledge and competence in the matter involved. The council may not reject a proposal outright, it may only report it, with or without a recommendation. Ordinarily, the presiding officer opens the assembly by presenting a pro voluma, or reported bill. Those who wish to speak are heard in the order of their age. But anyone may be disqualified from addressing the assembly if it can be shown that he is not a landowner, or is not legally married, or has neglected his duties to his parents, or has offended public morals, or has evaded a military obligation or has thrown away his shield in battle, or owes taxes or other money to the state. Only trained orators avail themselves of the right to speak, for the assembly is a difficult audience. It laughs at mispronunciations, protests aloud at digressions, expresses its approval with shouts, whistling, and clapping of hands, and, if it strongly disapproves, makes such a din that the speaker is compelled to leave the bema, or rostrum. Each speaker is allowed a given time, whose lapse is measured by a clepsydra, or water clock. 
Voting is by a show of hands unless some individual is directly and specially affected by the proposal, in which case a secret ballot is taken. The vote may confirm, amend, or override the Council's report on a bill, and the decision of the Assembly is final. Decrees for immediate action, as distinct from laws, may be enacted more expeditiously than new legislation, but such decrees may with equal expedition be cancelled and do not enter into the body of Athenian law. Above the assembly in dignity, inferior to it in power, is the boule, or council. Originally an upper house, it has by the time of Pericles been reduced in effect to a legislative committee of the ecclesia. Its members are chosen by lot and wrote from the register of the citizens, fifty for each of the ten tribes. They serve for a year only and receive, in the fourth century, five obols per day. Since each councillor is disqualified for re-election until all other eligible citizens have had a chance to serve, Every citizen, in the normal course of events, sits on the boule for at least one term during his life. It meets in the Bouluterion, or Council Hall, south of the Agora, and its ordinary sessions are public. Its functions are legislative, executive, and consultative. It examines and reformulates the bills proposed to the Assembly. It supervises the conduct and accounts of the religious and administrative officials of the city. It controls public finances, enterprises, and buildings. It issues executive decrees when action is called for and the Assembly is not in session, and subject to later revision by the Assembly, it controls the foreign affairs of the State. To perform these varied tasks, the Council divides itself into ten prytanies, or committees, each of fifty members, and each prytany presides over the Council and the Assembly for a month of thirty-six days. Every morning the presiding prytany chooses one of its members to serve as chairman of itself and the Council for the day. This position, the highest in the state, is therefore open by lot and turn to any citizen. Athens has three hundred presidents every year. The lot determines at the last moment which Brittany and which member of it shall preside over the council during the month or the day. By this device, the corrupt Athenians hope to reduce the corruption of justice to the lowest point attainable by human character. The acting Brittany prepares the agenda, convokes the council, and formulates the conclusions reached during the day. In this way, through assembly, council, and prytany, the democracy of Athens carries out its legislative functions. As for the Areopagus, its powers are in the 5th century restricted to trying cases of arson, willful violence, poisoning, or premeditated murder. Slowly, the law of Greece has been changed from status to contract, from the whim of one man or the edict of a narrow class into the deliberate agreement of free citizens. 2. Law the earliest Greeks appear to have conceived of law as sacred custom, divinely sanctioned and revealed. Thamus meant to them both these customs, and a goddess who, like India's Rita or China's Tao or Tien, embodied the moral order and harmony of the world. Law was a part of theology, and the oldest Greek laws of property were mingled with liturgical regulations in the ancient temple codes. Perhaps as old as such religious law were the rules established by the decrees of tribal chieftains or kings, which began as force and ended in time as sanctities. The second phase of Greek legal history was the collection and coordination of these holy customs by lawgivers, or thesmothetai, like Zeleucus, Carondas, Draco, Solon. When such men put their new codes into writing, the thesmoi, or sacred usages, became nomoi, or man-made laws. In these codes, law freed itself from religion and became increasingly secular. The intention of the agent entered more fully into judgment of the act, Family liability was replaced by individual responsibility, and private revenge gave way to statutory punishment by the state. The third step in Greek legal development was the accumulative growth of a body of law. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.